we come here uh, out of a dedication to understanding and we felt that there was a critical thing given what's going, a critical uh, opportunity that we couldn't uh, pass up in terms of trying to help us understand and cope with many of the things that are going on. Right now, it's, a, as we wrote in the journal, a critical time of geopolitics after four elections in just two years. The Israeli government is unsettled. Tensions are escalating over uh, demolitions and evictions in East Jerusalem. And dozens, at this time, we wrote, dozens had been killed. And now, unfortunately, those dozens have turned into uh, numbers that are just frightening. There's a growing concern that the latest escalation, escalation and conflict will spiral into an all-out war uh, in the weeks and months to come. Um, it has been uh, an emotional quandary because uh, it is uh, uh, very difficult to see the continual films of what is going on. It is so painful um, for anybody who loves peace and wants to have coexistence uh, in the Middle East to um, witness what we've been witnessing. It is very difficult for those of us who um, have lived and understood and are strong believers in Israel. Um, and it is a complex situation that grows even uh, more complex with the days. Um, it is also very difficult right now because uh, we have uh, entered in the last couple of years into a period of um, high, uh, hyperbole that is sometimes uh, so dangerous and, uh, and also, in a sense, uh, a very unique and difficult time for the worldwide, for the Jewish community. Um, we've seen, uh, and it's very hard to separate out certain issues and to really understand what are the political things and, uh, uh, that are going on and what are some of the catalysts. And uh, unfortunately, as Jonathan Sachs said many years ago uh, in one of his books, The Dignity of Diversity, and I think uh, also he repeats the comment in um, uh, Not in the Name of God, he says, we've ceased to broadcast news and we narrowcast news. And what he talked about is, is that, you know, uh, uh, as uh, many have talked about, uh, Often our news is no longer a real instrument of getting to the facts and the truth for us to form our opinions, but is interested in using a, a, as a tool uh, to help political parties or to form uh, and uh, bolster uh, political hegemony. Um, I'm not, this is not about uh, the media, um, uh, that's for another day. What this is about is trying for us as uh, caring and loving people and smart people to try to sort out what is and what isn't. In, uh, in my workings in Washington in these last three decades, uh, there are few people that are as, uh, have as much clarity and insight as, uh, as Jason Isaacson. Jason is the chief policy and political affairs officer. He's a longtime an uh, analyst of U.S. politics, strategy, and affairs, and an advocate for Arab-Israeli peace. He was an observer in 1991-92 in the Middle East peace talks in Madrid, Moscow, and Washington. He represents and works for the AJC. He was at the AJC's representative in 1993 in the World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna. Since 93, he has coordinated periodic AJC ministerial meetings throughout the Middle East, North Africa, Europe, and Asia. I can tell you a many a time I've been walking out of a building in Abu Dhabi in high level meetings or leaving uh, a meeting and I'll see off in a distant Jason often walking with a, a different group of people. Um, he has been an advocate for the Jewish people, but I complimented uh, him this afternoon because uh, Jason has always, always been able to sort out and give us the most, uh, uh, been able to give us the most unbiased and navigate some of the most difficult things with people pressuring large organizations to go this way and that way for political reasons. 
Um, and I'm so delighted that Jason has joined us. I could go on and on of this, but uh, I'm so delighted that Jason is with us this evening. Um, he's a good friend and he's been a fabulous friend of Washington Hebrew and his insights, I hope, will help us all begin to struggle together uh, to have some clarity of what's going on. So before we begin this evening, just as we do, um, Rabbi Miller has been really a partner in all this and helping me set up. Uh, when this came up, we all decided on senior staff that we needed to respond in some ways. And uh, besides praying, we wanted to learn. And so we have set up a series of three particular uh, evenings, uh, which we'll tell you a little bit about the more to come. But what is most important we want to prevail here is the opportunity that we have um, to continue in the vein that we've done in our congregational conversations. And I'm gonna call on Rabbi Miller to share and read what is our civility pledge and to share a little bit about what we hope to achieve. Um, I hope I have this up where he can read it. Is it there, Rabbi? Yes. Okay, yeah. and you just tell me when to move up. I'll do it. I'll try to follow you. Conversation is a form of prayer. That is a startling and powerful idea. A genuine encounter with a human other can be a prelude to an encounter with the divine other. The, the disciplines required are the same, to be open, to listen as well as to speak, to be capable of empathy and humility, to honor the other by an act of focused attention. Nor is this a minor matter. The greatest command of all, Shema Yisrael, literally means, hear, O Israel. And so we are going to share in this civility pledge. I know you are all on mute, but by virtue of you coming to this program and, uh, and committing to learning together, uh, this is a pledge that, uh, that we all share in equally. Uh, just as important as the conversation the three of us are going to have uh, is the quality of civility that will come between the three of us, of course, and you as our learning community, um, especially as we go to a, a Q&A session where uh, we, we will ask some of the questions that you send, and I'll share a bit on that in just a moment, um, is the quality of the conversation, the, the kindness, the, the longing for understanding uh, and empathy for those who might see a very complicated situation differently from you. Uh, the quality of the conversation tonight is just as important as the content. And so with that, we share in this civility each individual participant in these WHC congregational conversations has entered into the ancient Jewish tradition of learning. We have joined a Beit Midrash, a house of study, where our engagement is enriched by the perspectives of others. A cornerstone of these congreg congregational conversations is civil, considerate discussion. By gathering to learn from one another, we commit ourselves and ask ourselves to open their hearts and minds in healthy, respectful dialogue. We pledge to guard our tongues, showing care for the dignity of every human being, even those with whom we may strongly disagree. We will listen carefully when others speak, seeking to understand what is being said and trying to learn from it. We pledge that these robust and engaging discussions will remain welcoming to all. We commit ourselves to this course because that is who we are. And in so doing, this is how we preserve an essential element of our community, the ability to meet and talk as members of one loving congregation. With the love that brings us together as a congregation, it is, uh, again, my honor and our, uh, our uh, just uh, joy to welcome Jason Isaacson. Thank you so much for joining us. And Rabbi, during this, if uh, you wanna share, uh, I believe that if there are particular questions that you yes. think of, you can put them, you can go up to Rabbi Miller He's a co-host listed on the, if you highlight in participants, correct me, Aaron, if I'm not giving the right instructions, sure. and then you can just uh, send a question directly to them or put it into the chat for everyone. Well, and actually, I'm going to encourage you to, uh, not to, if, if you could please, uh, it takes it one extra step. Don't send your question to everyone. If you could send those questions to me and then given whatever time we have left, I can't promise that we will get to all of your questions, uh, but I will do my best to filter all of the uh, private questions that have been sent to me. Uh, there might be common themes that I'll be able to combine and then ask our, our guests tonight. So send those questions to me and I will process those for the tail end of our conversation. So again, Jason, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank again, Rabbi Miller for his help with uh, organizing this and. 
Uh, he and I both uh, uh, share an extraordinary passion for Israel um, and, uh, and also uh, an extraordinary passion uh, and impained uh, by the situation for just as rabbis and understanding. Um, Jason, um, can you briefly share, and I know that this, this is a very open-ended question, but, you know, um, how did we get to where we are? And, you know, placing as best as you can this conflict in the context of what's really the factors that keeps this uh, in this sort of escalation mode. And I know you've spent a, a lot of times, and I think it's important to just not from what's happening, but for to just give us the background on that so we can begin to ferret out and have an understanding. Rabbi, thank you. And, and thank you, Rabbi, Rabbi Miller as well. Um, it is really a pleasure to be with the Washington Hebrew uh, this evening. Um, well, uh, it sort of depends on how far back you want me to go. I mean, I, I, I think it might be useful to describe the various developments and, and, and forces that led to where we are today uh, after the last several weeks of uh, sort of simmering tension. Um, tension is not, of course, a new thing in that region. Uh, tension is not new between Israelis and Palestinians, between Israel and Hamas. Um, but, but what we have seen explode in the last uh, 10, 11 days, um, I believe, can be traced to several factors um, and several developments. Um, you have, of course, the decision by President Abbas to cancel the um, Palestinian legislative elections. It was a decision that I believe was announced on April 30th. The legislative elections were supposed to be scheduled um, actually on the, the 22nd of May. Um, he canceled them, um, blaming Israel for uh, not making it possible for East Jerusalemites to be able to vote. That was nonsense. Um, he, he canceled the elections because uh, Fatah wasn't doing very well in the elections. It's weak, it's divided, uh, it's actually fractured uh, now. Uh, and Hamas appeared poised to win substantial uh, number of seats in the Legislative Council uh, and, and really to be in a position to even displace Fatah uh, in leadership of the, uh, of the Palestinian Authority. Um, that's one element. Um, second element, of course, is um, the um, during Ramadan, um, as uh, as you have seen on viral videos, of course, um, and and in the mainstream media as well, uh, there was a police action that uh, that Israel conducted on the Al Aqsa Mosque uh, compound. Um, it has been uh, traditional um, during Jerusalem Day and at other times for um, at times of tension and protest for. Uh, Palestinians on the Temple Mount to hurl rocks on the plaza below, uh, the Western Wall Plaza, and, uh, and injuring Israelis and injuring uh, Israeli uh, officers as well. Uh, to prevent that, there was a, a raid to uh, eliminate that stockpile that was in, in the mosque. Um, one could say it was uh, ill-timed, one could say it was heavy-handed. Um, it uh, certainly served as a predicate for um, a great deal of uh, distress across the Muslim world uh, and, a, and, a, and a focus that we've seen again and again as, as, as on uh, social media, but in other places as well, descriptions of Israel invading Al-Aqsa and, and seizing Al-Aqsa and, uh, and committing every possible kind of violation. It's been blown up out of incredible proportion. This was a, apparently a half hour uh, uh, visit uh, to, 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 um, to, to the site, um, but it has taken on a life of its own. Um, so there was the police action on the, on the plaza. Um, there is, of course, the case of the uh, proposed uh, evictions uh, because of a, of, a, of a real estate dispute in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of East Jerusalem. Um, these were uh, a few f Palestinian families who had been living for a couple of gener several generations in uh, in houses on land that at one point was owned by an Israeli, a Jewish trust, was then sold to another Jewish trust. Uh, and then in 1948, Jordan took the land, as you all know. And from 1948 to 1967, uh, Jordan was in control of this land that was by law uh, owned by Jews, but of course there were no Jews allowed there. Palestinian families were moved onto this land and, and occupied uh, houses on this, on this property. 
and then um, then when Israel retook the property in 19 the land in 1967 uh, in the 67 war uh, there was a question that then arose about how the people who actually owned the land legally could get it back and this has dragged on for decades and it has been nearing a resolution um, and the resolution that of course the property owners want is to evict the uh, the Palestinians from land on which they're not paying rent to the actual owners. Um, it could be said that a wiser heads would not allow this to move forward, that if uh, the Israeli government were, um, if there were an Israeli government after multiple elections over the course of two years, uh, and if it had the kind of coalition that would support uh, taking tough action against um, the people who actually legally own the land, uh, it would be possible to find some way out of this crisis. But instead, we had a crisis and we had an incredible media opportunity for um, haters of Israel to showcase uh, this uh, issue uh, in the harshest possible light. Um, so I would say there was a, uh, a tragic uh, series of incidents involving Sheikh Jarrah and it was blown up again out of proportion to the actuality of four pieces of property that could be settled in court. And in fact, it will ultimately be settled in court. And that's a second element. So we have the cancellation, we have the, the, uh, the incident on, on the Temple Mount and of course, Sheikh Jarrah. But what you also have, of course, is Hamas, which has been stockpiling weapons, has both imported and, but also quite um, uh, vigorously uh, can, um, created an entire industry of, of, of building missiles that are uh, ever more powerful and longer range and, and somewhat more accurate. Uh, and, and Hamas saw an opportunity. They saw an opportunity to appear as the great protectors of, of, uh, of Al-Aqsa, the third holiest site in Islam. They saw themselves as, a, uh, as having an opportunity to assert their primacy um, among Palestinian factions. Um, yes, they were denied the opportunity to, to win in an election, but they could show that they really are calling the shots among the Palestinians. And by uh, assuming the mantle of protector of Al-Aqsa and protector of Palestinians who were being dispossessed or legally threatened with dispossession in East Jerusalem, they could, uh, they could really capture the hearts and minds of not only Palestinian people, but of the wider Arab world and the wider Muslim world. And that's what they have sought to do. And so by attacking with barrage after barrage of missiles fired into Israel, now some 4,000 rockets that have been fired into Israel. Um, not all of them have reached Israel, but uh, the great majority have. They are flexing their muscles and they're asserting their primacy. Um, so how do you unwind this? I mean, Rabbi, you and I could spend some time going through that and I expect we, we will. Um, but that's the situation that we find today. It's a political uh, issue. It's a legal issue. Uh, it is a uh, combination of human right of excuse me of of, of I would say policy um, missteps and certainly PR missteps. Uh, but but it's not. It's important not to get away from the one essential fact, which is that there is a terrorist organization that is firing wave after wave of rockets into Israeli cities and towns and with the intention of killing Jews. So we mustn't forget that as we deal with the complexity of sorting out the political situation, the humanitarian situation uh, in, in both Gaza and, and also frankly in the West Bank and in Israel proper. How much, um, you know, there's, and it's a loaded question and I don't really mean it to be, but, um, you know, how much of this, uh, as it began to develop, uh, was part of the internal, the way things were handled, do you believe was in part, or was it in part, of the internal politics of the jockeying of, um, uh, of the creation of a government? It came at, you know, at this critical time when people were, uh, you know, trying to, to form a government we do know that there have been candidates in Israel and individuals in Israel who've uh, seemingly exasperated the uh, situation and the tensions uh, for political gain. Was there any of that that seems to be, I'm, I mean, we've read that, but is there, um, does that seem in any way, uh, did the government operate in a way other than it's operated before? Uh 
I think it's fair to say that that is a factor. Um, I don't think it's the dominant factor, um, but but yes, I do believe that um, that there was a, a, a hesitance uh, hesitancy to confront um, those who um, who would inflame the situation, um, and uh, and 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 it's tough. Um, I, I recognize the complexities of putting together a governing coalition. I, I whether I recognize it or not, it's a fact. We've seen it over the last couple of years of an inability to form a government um, because of in, inconclusive elections. Um, so yes, I think the politics in Israel um, are a factor, um, but 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 it's not the dominant factor. Jason, since you've, you know, I, I, you do a lot of global hopping and you've been involved in so things. And um, I, I want everybody to know that, you know, uh, Jason has been uh, the work of uh, not just the AJC, but in particular, Jason Isaacson, I think has been, was particularly uh, helpful in the creation of the Abraham Accords uh, in the sense that, uh, He's been working in that area of the world, building bridges and opportunities in, in such a, a profound way. And we're incredibly grateful because all of those are the best bridge to, I believe, to peace and uh, the hope for the region. Um, what, is, what is this, how is this affecting uh, global politics? Um, well, first of all, Rabbi, you're very kind with your remarks, so thank you. Um, and we have been partners in this effort for a long time. So I, I appreciate what you said about me and I, I will say the same about you. Um, and, and just as you have seen me leaving offices in, in, in strange places, I have also um, watched you and been in your wake as well. Um, it, it's interesting, um, you know, we have a, an AJC Global Forum that's taking place in uh, just uh, two and a half weeks, early, early June, June six to nine. I, I, I hope that people will, um, we'll, we'll go to our website and tune in. Um, and a lot of the planning that, of course, one plans these gigantic conferences months in advance. And, and a lot of our plans uh, focused on the idea of highlighting the emerging new Middle East. We spent a lot of time planning programs on the new Middle East that was emerging. Um, and you, know, you and I have talked about this a number of times in the past, of course, and, and we've been part of this momentum, uh, absolutely. And you did see from August to December of this last year, actually on into early January, four Arab states that uh, in the time of the, the last months of the Trump administration uh, did either fully recognize Israel or moved on the path of uh, full recognition, toward full recognition. So that normalization of, of relations, which tripled the number of Arab states that had normal relations with the state of Israel it was phenomenal and allowed us to, to, to dream big and to feel that somehow what you've been working for and what I've been working for through, frankly, the 30 years that I've been with AJC um, was finally coming to pass. Um, breathtaking, historic. Uh, you know, I think it's still happening. Uh, I, I will tell you that um, I have been in touch with the Abraham Accords countries uh, in the last uh, days um, quite regularly. We have plans in our global forum for uh, ministers from a couple of these countries and um, we're still going back and forth with the embassies and with the, with the foreign ministries about these plans. There, that's, that hasn't changed. Um, some of the commentary from some of these places has been a little harsh, but this side of the line, um, They've known that there's a line that they did not want to cross. Uh, there was, I know, a big protest in Rabat over the weekend, um, maybe a thousand people uh, chanting, uh, you know, calls to kill the normalization between Morocco and, and Israel. But the Moroccan government, the, the palace, uh, the, the foreign ministry haven't gone that far. You did have a meeting of Arab League foreign ministers a week or so ago, and there were some harsh words that were spoken in that meeting, but, um, but I would say no resolution that, uh, that, that other than calling for an ICC war crimes investigation and um, uh, expressing solidarity, of course, with the Palestinian cause, but in terms of freezing, reversing the steps that have been taken to normalize relations, um, there have been kind of uh, secondary uh, individuals who are calling for that, um, people who are not especially prominent. Uh, obviously, some social media activity, of course, but but responsible government officials haven't gone that far. Um, 
I, I expect that what we will see, or I'm hoping uh, and expecting that what we will see is in, in, a, in pretty short order, in the next day or two or three, um, a winding down of the conflict, which will take some of the pressure off, obviously. Uh, there will still be pressure and there will still be people who are very distressed by, what, by, by, by the suffering that's occurred. Uh, and we'll continue to identify, of course, the Palestinian cause. But, but I believe that the crisis will pass. Um, the benefits of the relationship that these countries have created, these four countries with Israel, are so apparent, so apparent to the elites in these countries and increasingly to not just the elites in these countries. And, and I, I do believe that while things may slow publicly a little bit over the coming days or weeks or even months, um, the benefits are so abundant, so, so, so obvious that, um, that, that the good sense of the leaders will prevail and, and we'll, we'll stay on track. Yeah, so, um, oh, I, I want to, Aaron, I'm going to, I want to turn to you in just a second, to, but I want to follow up with uh, one thing. And I know that our, we're going to have a whole evening to deal with this, but part of this, even it, this plays out is actually part, is it not part of the tension of the Abrahamic Accord, the tension between these four progressive uh, uh units of uh, nation states that are uh, entering into the opportunity for normalization of have normalized relations and entering in all sorts of great opportunities to to change that new Middle East that you talk about and the person that is the 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 player that is up against that um, and when I say this I'm I'm saying this I'm probably uh, the most liberal on on uh, of us sitting on the, the panel, and that's, and, and that's just not to say that my other two colleagues are liberal, but I'm just, you know, far, far over there. And I'm the one who's saying that this smells of Iran in so much, because the funding, even though that it comes to Hamas through Qatar, um, is clearly orchestrated uh, through Hezbollah and others in Hamas. And so this type of tension is exactly what, what they're looking for to undermine or to break up uh, that movement of who's going to have the power in the Middle East. Is that, is that anywhere accurate, Jason? Or Totally, uh, totally, totally, Bruce. Uh, the, um, you saw the, uh, the comments, I know you follow the UAE quite closely, you saw the comments from the UAE just the other day about Hamas. Right. Phenomenal statement by uh, the government of the United Arab Emirates against an Islamic faction. Uh, well, except that you have also seen comments about Hezbollah in the past, um, right. and, and obviously the Muslim Brotherhood, and it's, it's, uh, there's no difference if you're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood or Hamas, but in the midst of a conflict in which Hamas is portraying itself as the defender of the Palestinian people, Palestinian cause, uh, for an Arab government that is already you know, stained in the eyes of the uh, social media influencers uh, on, on that side uh, because of its relationship with Israel, for them to boldly uh, talk about the, the danger to the region posed by Hamas and the danger to, to, to a, a state by attacking that state that is posed by Hamas was really quite remarkable. Um, I, I do believe that we will continue to see that because they see, as you are pointing out, in the, in, in the, in the reality of Hamas and the threat that it poses, um, really no distinction between that and, and the Iranian threat and the Muslim Brotherhood threat. And in some cases also the threat posed by uh, President Erdogan of Turkey. Um, it, that's it, not, not unrelated it, to this as well. I wanna turn, uh, Rabbi Miller, you, you've mentioned this in, with great concern and I, I, I wanna commend you for your continued leadership in the young professional um, community uh, you've built an incredible following uh, over the years. Um, just as we see, and I want uh, maybe Jason to talk a little bit more about how this is resonating and what's going on within our own American politics. But first, Aaron, tell us a little bit of what you're seeing or how uh, what's going on am amongst young professionals and how how you what you might think this ramification could be uh, amongst our you know uh, for those people who are. You, are, you struggle so often to keep them from being so marginalized from Israel before a conflict like this. Sure. You're also going to hear some kids in the background. It's bedtime. Um, 
talk about conflict. Young Zionists, no doubt. That's right. That's right. Um, it, this, it, it's a fascinating topic of a conversation. To, to the extent that young professionals can be separated and segmented out from larger society, I think is a bigger question. I think demographics are showing, especially when you study Jewish demographics, that young Jews tend to be um, overwhelmingly, uh, uh, especially if uh, non-Orthodox, I should say, uh, young Jews are overwhelmingly uh, liberal and vote consistently uh, along liberal party lines. Um, there are a few things to point out. I, I think that there is a that there are three groups of people, um, and Jason, I'm actually interested to hear how how your understanding of this uh, plays out as well. Um, uh, there are there are uh, Jews, young Jews, who on in in places more on the political right of the spectrum find themselves welcomed in with open arms, uh, see their Jewishness and their attachment to Israel as something uh, worth celebrating, at least in a certain mainstream spectrum of the political right. Um, you'll find also on the political left, uh, Jews who might care very much about Israel um, being put in a very difficult situation. I was a Hillel rabbi, as were you, Bruce. We were at the same college in separate, in separate decades, but um, uh, you find young Jews who, who would otherwise associate very strongly with, uh, with the state of Israel, or at least feel an emotional attachment. Uh, the recent Pew studies found that some 82% of, of Jews feel this emotional attachment to Israel, um, but it feels like the entry card into democratic politics or liberal conversations is the first, uh, you, you must first forego, give up your, your Zionist card, your, your attachment to Israel card in a public and demonstrative way. And that's a very difficult place that a lot of young Jews who might otherwise feel attachment to Israel and otherwise liberal causes in the United States find themselves to be, find themselves in. And, and the third group is this large group of 20s and 30s who, who may not have uh, been around during some of the nation building moments, right? Uh, 48, obviously, 67, certainly one of these pivotal moments in Israeli history. Um, and, uh, and the Soviet, uh, the Soviet Jewry movement, these national, global, international movements that built the Jewish community, um, younger people weren't around for those. Uh, and one of the most difficult things that I found, and again, Jason, and Jason I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, be interested in what you hear as well, is that for someone who's 25, um, Benjamin Netanyahu has been the prime minister for their entire worldly consciousness. Um, there is no Israel without a Likud government. Uh, and that's a very, uh, is a unified picture of Israel that obviously does not represent the entire political spectrum in Israel. In fact, the reason why there are so many elections just in recent years is that he's a very controversial figure. Um, so, uh, so there are people who find themselves in the middle, confused, hurt by the right, hurt by the left, and feeling politically homeless now as these political crises come up in the Middle East. And, and I, before we get to Jason, I'm, I'm going to, I have, uh, <laughs> this is kind of interesting. Aaron knows the, the young people in the Jewish community. I'm very involved in something of knowing the young people in the Muslim community. Um, I'm, uh, I run through uh, an international program called HELP, uh, which is uh, the um, human, uh, human document of human, the, the document of human fraternity uh, uh, education and leadership uh, for peace program, and it's a dialogue between people, all Mus young Muslims and Christians, uh, all over, uh, mostly in the Middle East and Asia and whatever. One of the very interesting things that happens is that um, they are very step back and they understand the geopolitics and stuff. What seemed to be unforgivable was that during the month of Ramadan that um, the optics, if we, in our Jewish tradition, we say Marid Ayan, you don't do something, even if it's, you're allowed to do something, if it looks like something, the optics of blocking the Damascus Gate in the, the weeks before, the optics of going on and uh, whatever happened up on the Al-Aqsa Mosque and people being pulled out and tear gas being used and other things um, uh, was, uh, It'll take months, if not years, to get over uh, that impact. Most of the things that are written about that is, is just saying that uh, 
uh, there is an unwritten law that sacred spaces are sacred. And that just like when somebody goes in and kills in a church uh, in New Zealand, or somebody uh, goes into the tree of life and shoots on the Sabbath uh, that, to go into uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque for whatever reason uh, is unjustifiable and um, unacceptable. And uh, that is the level on which the majority of the things that I'm seeing uh, written about, the responses to those people are doing, have been, you know, saying that, you know, you'll find people in there who accelerate that and say, this is proof of why we shouldn't do whatever, that they don't care, that they're not trustworthy, that whatever in the blanket statements. So how do we contend with these things? Uh, Jason, I know you'll give us the answer here and uh, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I'll say. Right, I, right. I see a hand up and I want to uh, maybe we'll get to that in a minute. We can talk, but go ahead. Sure, I mean, I'm not sure that I can, I can enlighten this discussion so much that we will have the way forward um, instantly. However, it, it can be said that... Um, the kind of work that you've been involved in with the higher committee in the UAE, the kind of work that my colleagues, uh, Rabbi David Rosen in Jerusalem, whom you know, uh, Dr. Ari Gordon in New York, whom you know, um, in our Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, that kind of, of really serious um, uh, opening your heart uh, dialogue and, and listening to the other and, and sympathizing with the other, empathizing with the other, um, and, 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 imparting your own perspective to people who, who are therefore open as well and with whom one develops trust. I know that's not necessarily as strong as the negative optics that are conveyed in a million tweets. Um, it's not as strong as the perception of, a, of government aggression as it is portrayed, um, but over time, and magnified by all of the other people of goodwill whom you have run across and I have run across, um, I believe we can start changing that narrative. But obviously government has to help. It shouldn't be a hindrance. Um, and this is the dilemma that one finds oneself in when one is talking about um, a government that is, is in the main justified in its actions, but is a complica complicated democratic mechanism that responds in various moments to different kinds of pressure groups within that complicated democracy. Uh, and you just have to be able to step back and say, what are the real issues? How do we solve it? Um, let's keep doing the, the positive things that you've been doing, that we've been trying to do in AJC. Um, and let's hope that the politics can take care of itself because it's not working now, but it has to work. It has to be made to work. So I'm gonna put a friend of mine on and a board member on, uh in, uh, I'm gonna do something one should never do. I'm putting him on the spot, literally. Um, I used to call on, uh, Ed Joseph has, uh, uh, has been all over the world in diplomatic uh, roles. And uh, Ed came in and uh, years ago, I brought him into confirmation to explain to us what was going on in Sarajevo because uh, he'd, uh, in the in-between of coming to see his mom home when he was between coming, um, Edward, in your experience, uh, uh, how do we make our way out of some of these things? Because, I mean, you, you were in a quagmire in a place that was uh, a tender box uh, for, for generations as well. This is, tell them a little bit of what you've done in the past, Ed, just because I know your background, but others sure. don't. Know. Thank you, uh, Rabbi Lustig, and uh, I really appreciate that, and I, I want to get back to Jason, and I'm sure that that's where folks uh, want to hear from, and I have a question for you, Jason, I'll, by way of Bruce's generous introduction, uh, I'll just quickly say, uh, I've worked in, most of my career has been in conflict areas, uh, particularly in the Balkans, and uh, I was there for 12 years, and uh, throughout the war years in, in all those various countries, including Bosnia, and the uh, just two very fast things for our audience, obviously, as we want to get back to Israel and Gaza, is just uh, the, the key takeaway, Rabbi Lustig, 
and Rabbi Miller and, and Jason uh, and everyone is how, just how difficult it is uh, for those of us who have an investment in these countries to become, to be de uh, detached and analytical and to try to uh, separate our, our strong emotions from uh, our principles and, and also practical uh, realities. And it's very difficult to do that. It's very difficult for diaspora groups to do that. And I've engaged with them with Serbs and Croats and Bosniaks and so forth uh, and Albanians. And it's, it's, it's very hard. And we ourselves, of course, wrestle with all of that. And Rabbi Lustig has been a leader in, in uh, breaking through uh, in the interfaith level and trying to uh, establish communication, which is uh, so essential with, with quote, the other. Uh, I, I, the only other thing I quickly say is in Bosnia, Jews have played a very interesting role and even in their small numbers, uh, still actually play a, an interesting role. And Israel has been very important uh, for those Jews. And Israel was a place of refuge for the Jews of Bosnia during the war. So, uh, of course, that's the Zionism and, and our, uh, what brings us all together in our interest. Uh, Jason, let me pivot to myself, to, to the question for you that I have, again, all by way of being totally analytical, you know, as much as we can be and, and detached uh, here and without betraying any, you know, belief in, in, in so forth about the, this current and the terrible suffering and so forth. But just being, Jason, really, you know, with all your experience here, uh, it seems to me something has changed uh, with this event. Uh, you, you, and, and, and that, uh, to me, is the key question is, uh, you seem to sort of suggest uh, this is going to calm down and uh, we'll go back and, you know, life will move on. And, you, and, and I appreciated that. And I was encouraged what you said about, well, you know, this Abraham Accords, it's been encouraging. And, you know, uh, sure, there's a protest in Morocco and so forth. But basically, uh, you know, that's on track. To me, Jason, that is really the key question. Because as I read this, and I'm reading what Palestinians are saying, they're saying, uh-uh, not so fast. Uh, don't think you're going on with your Abraham Accords. Don't think even you're going on with your uh, two-state solution. Ain't working. We're not going for it anymore. And we're united now. This isn't about Hamas. You know, don't think you can just paint this as, you know, the terror group Hamas. This is all of us now. Uh, we're all in this together. And we ain't, it, 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 and we're not moving on. And so, and where that leads us and where we all as Jews need to be concerned is, of course, end of Israel as a Jewish state. Because where that ends, uh, this type of thing uh, ends, and Jason, you know this infinitely better than I, is it ends in the one state solution. And uh, the one state solution does not end with uh, a Jewish state. Uh, and that's my question for you, Jason. Is this really even, you know, we hope that things will calm down very soon, but you really believe things are just going to kind of go back or is this a new era? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. That's a tough question, Ed, obviously. Um, thank you for posing it. Um, it is a crucial question. I mean, to some degree, of course, I'm speaking with my heart when I talk about my expectation that this thing will calm down because you and I and all of us have been through situations before in which um, terrible explosions of violence occurred. Uh, thousands of Palestinians were killed in Gaza um, seven years ago, I believe it was, that summer. Um, and, and then things calmed down eventually, um, not without a lot of wounds that never healed, not without a lot of hard feelings that will not go away. Um, you know, does it get harder each time there is an eruption such as this to restore some sanity and some possibility of returning to a path toward peace? Is that path toward peace even feasible at this stage? Um, I am very worried about the spillover of this into Israel itself, the, the terrible scenes of violence that we've seen, uh, people being dragged out of cars and beaten, uh, beaten to death. Um, really lynchings, um, 
and 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 destruction of property and um, and, and people rendered homeless um, in Israel itself. Um, in addition to what's happening in the West Bank, in addition to what's happening in Gaza, um, in addition to the thousands of rockets that are falling on Israel itself. So um, this does seem to have reached yet a higher level than we have sometimes seen in the past. Does that mean that we can't find a way back to something more normal? Does it mean that the two-state solution is over? That it's not any longer achievable? I don't believe that. Um, I don't believe that there is a better alternative, not that it's a perfect alternative, not that it's going to be even close to easily achieved, but we can at least start removing some of the obstacles to it. We can start building some trust. We can start encouraging the kind of interdependence between Israelis and Palestinians once we get past this current crisis and the recovery period um, to give the politicians the sense that they have, the people have stake a real stake in making this work rather than destroying it. Um, that's what AJC has been trying to do in our quiet conversations with Palestinian business people and Israeli business people to try to encourage that kind of interaction. It's a monumental task. We are taking small bites out of it. Others are doing it as well. Um, and I know that the good people who are part of this conversation want to see that kind of progress. But I'm not ready to write off the possibility that this thing can result in, in progress, ultimately. I am worried. Um, you know, Jews are accustomed to being worried. I do believe that we can get past this. You know, Jason, I, uh, I, I, first of all, Ed, it's a, it's a great question that you asked. And um, the question that, uh, that I think that is part of... Uh, that's partly there is I'm not sure the assumption that's there, and I think that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question, is that we're all we're all one because I do not think the Palestinian people and Hamas are one, and I think that some of the uh, analysis that has gone on is is really talking about the fact is is that they have the Palestinian people and Hamas have two different objectives. The objectives of Hamas is for uh, they're not to be a state of Israel, um, ultimately. Uh, the objective of the Palestinian people is to come out of, uh, to have liberation from the oppression that has gone on, that has not only been from their political situation with Israel, but also their political situation from all the other Arab nations in terms of it, you know. Um, uh, uh, and from we, their own political leaders their own political leaders. It's even so far as I was once at a soccer match in Cuba. And what do they call the visiting people? They yell at the visiting people as an insult for people who come into their city. They call them Palestinians. It's a, it's a, a, a name in terms of being for the outlier, the person that doesn't fit, the person that's, that, that's doing. And so, you know, it is a horrible situation. I highly encourage people to read the book that we're going to have this Sunday in Scholar Series, uh, uh, Yosef Bashar, um, uh, uh, My Father's Word, uh, uh, Pain and uh, Pain and Promise in Palestine. Uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, Leslie Maitland had to be clairvoyant when she picked this for this Sunday. It is unbelievable. Um, I we cannot record. It as uh, unfortunately, and many people that I've tried who are good partners with me do not feel comfortable right now going on programs because they fear for family in, in Gaza. Um, and that's a horrible situation that you would come and share your mind and somebody would, uh, you know, uh, call you a, 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 a co-conspirator or whatever, um, uh, or, you know, alienating your people. But it's a really good question, Ed, about how far and, and what's happening. And I look forward to asking um, Yosef Bashar, uh, whose father was this profound peace person who would not give up his home. And then the Israeli army occupied his home uh, and unfortunately shot Yosef in the back when he was 13 years old. It's an unbelievable story and worth reading. But the, so there's the hearts and what has happened, the change. But I do think that there has been, and we've seen this, a real change in the last four years that may come to a crescendo of this, 
in American politics. And this is where I'd like to turn the question to you, Jason, on this is that um, several people have sent me and it's, uh, a excuse me, my boys want to go out and I'm going to have to get them in a minute. Um, they're very big supporters of, uh, they're doing, I'll be there in a second. Um, one of the things that uh, Representative, I think his name is Torres, the young congressman from New York, who's uh, written and spoke so beautifully, uh, stood on the floor and showed a map that's there and said, what's wrong with this map? It doesn't show the state of Israel. And don't be fooled because they're putting peace signs and flowers where Israel was. It means that they don't want Israel to exist. Um, so what is happening on the American situation, Jason, with our administration, um, which at first had a hands-off, we haven't even named an American ambassador to Israel yet, um, and uh, how has this played out? I'm listening while I step to open the door for my dogs. Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, um, yes, it's true that the, um, the U.S. government has not named an ambassador to Israel or to many places. Um, that's not so unusual. Um, you'll recall the previous administration also took a long time to, to, to appoint many ambassadors. In fact, there were even some posts that stayed empty throughout the entire administration. Um, but an ambassador to Israel is desperately needed and, and there have been increasing calls for that. And I'm expecting sometime very soon. I was led to believe a couple of weeks ago that it was also very soon then, um, but that that, will, that appointment will come through quite, uh, quite soon. Um, the, um, What's happening in American politics, of course, you have Joe Biden, who um, through his 36 years in the Senate and eight years as vice president, uh, built a, an impressive pro-Israel record and is seen by many as, uh, as a longtime, very consistent, uh, very sincere friend of Israel. Um, visited many times, talks all the time about the multiple relationships he had with Israeli prime ministers, um, including with, uh, you know, with then Deputy Chief of Mission at the Israeli uh, Embassy in Washington, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, and he was a young man, um, and he and and Biden was a young senator. The statements that have come out of the Biden administration throughout this ordeal have been very supportive. The public statements, um, talking about Israel's right to defend itself, from the president, from uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, from others as well. Um, Private messaging has, um, I believe, been sharper. Um, and what you heard from uh, Jen Psaki uh, yesterday, it was, or the day before, um, a, a, an assertion that the foreign policy conduct of this administration will be uh, to talk to friends um, when you have a sharp message privately rather than publicly. Um, and that's a, it's a nice change in, in, in policy from a U.S. government, and I believe it's probably going to be more effective. What you started to see over the last day or so is a subtle shift away from just flat out um, defending Israel's right to defend itself, which has been so welcome, uh, and standing by Israel and identifying Hamas as the culprit here, uh, to calling for de-escalation, to calling for so first privately calling for a ceasefire and then more publicly over the last uh, one day, let's say, uh, you, you, you see uh, the president speaking about ceasefire uh, in a way that, uh, that is now acknowledged as his position. And uh, Speaker Pelosi, uh, similarly, uh, the leadership of the Democratic Party has been, I would say, solidly um, behind Israel's right to defend itself, expressing, of course, um, uh, grief over the suffering that Palestinians have, uh, have experienced and also uh, Israelis, um, but, um, but, but focusing on Hamas and focusing on the, um, the, the, the war crime that is being conducted serially by Hamas and firing rockets in Israel. That's not the case for everyone in the Democratic Party without question. Um, you now have a very significant, very large percentage of the Democratic caucus in the House and a number of Democratic senators as well not only Bernie Sanders, but actually quite a larger number um, who have been critical of uh, the way Israel has defended itself in this action in, in, in these last uh, 10 or 11 days. More than you saw in 2014, more than you saw in previous instances. Um, we have seen, of course, the, um, uh, the fierce activity on social media uh, among progressive elements of uh, 
not just the democratic constituency here, but, but, but of course around the world, um, ganging up against Israel uh, is one way of putting it. And, 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 and media folks and celebrities uh, who, are, who, are, who are portraying this as a totally a one-sided, Israel is oppressing the Palestinians, they're aggressive, they're conducting you know, genocidal attacks against, uh, against Gaza. It's really, it's gotten so far out of reality that, um, and it's perpetuated itself and it's fed this, this, this machine within, unfortunately, the democratic constituency that has started sh shifting the, um, the, the, the needle in that, in that caucus. Is it dominant? No. Um, is it uh, emerging and rising and increasingly significant? Yes. And it is something that AJC is quite um, conscious of. We are reaching out constantly to all wings of the Democratic Party, including uh, with special focus on progressives, uh, trying to um, introduce the more accurate narrative of what is happening there. Not saying that Israel is a perfect place. Um, it is not uh, paradise. Uh, it is a real country with real enemies on its border. And some of those enemies are firing thousands of rockets at its civilians. Uh, and we try to make that point while also saying that efforts have to be made to reach a political solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They cannot be ignored. Um, we, have, uh, we have said that consistently, and we believe that with friends on Capitol Hill and friends in civil society and in our various coalitions that you and I have been part of creating over the years, um, not just I, but all of us, um, we, we think that, that we can make some headway. But, but it is a more challenging time politically, and especially in that caucus, whereas you see on the Republican side, virtual unanimity uh, in, in support for Israel, which, which is another danger, the danger of this becoming really a partisan issue. And that is something that we have sought consistently for decades to avoid. And it is in our interest to make sure that that is, does not become the new reality in American politics. Israel has to be, remain a bipartisan issue, a subject to bipartisan support. We can restore it. It still is hanging on, but, um, but it's under enormous challenge. We have to work very hard to prevent that from, uh, from, from, from changing. Uh, I, I, said, I, I want to turn to one last thing and then we can move to questions. I'm sorry, Aaron, but I sent you an article earlier and I know that uh, you talked about it. And, and when we'd mentioned both when Ed mentioned what went on and we're saying, and I know in the chat and all of us, you know, we've lived this before. Uh, seven years ago in 2014, the same escalation, the same sort of thing or whatever. But Maddie Friedman, who, is, uh, who wrote a piece in the tablet then, called An Insider's Guide to the Most Important Story on Earth. A former AP correspondent explains how and why reporters get Israel so wrong and why it matters. He wrote this in August of 2014. I happen to be in Israel at the particular time. And one of the things that he talks about is the disproportionate place, uh, how important is the Israel story? Uh, staffing is the best measure of importance of a story to a particular news organization, okay? And he writes, when I, uh, when I was the correspondent at the AP, the agency had more than 40 staffers covering the Israel-Palestinian territories. That was significantly more news staffers than an AP had in China, Russia, or India, or in all of the 50 countries of sub-Saharan Africa combined. It was higher than the total number of news gathering employees in all the countries where the uprising of the Arab Spring eventually erupted. That there's this disproportionate look uh, onto Israel and raising it up. I, uh, I'll try to get... Uh, I have Ira look up this uh, article. It's from Tablet, um, and maybe we can put it into the chat for people to have. It's by Matty, M-A-T-T-I, Friedman, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, uh, Israel in the Middle East. Um, he, he brings out something, and this is years ago. Now, I mean, the, the piece that's there is just it, it, what's going on, and everywhere we turn, it's, uh, and now we add the, part of social media, how do we contend with this? Is this in, why is this getting so many things when, you know, um, numbers of people in the Rohingyans and others, it, it, we've always faced this. We have, um, 
that was a brilliant article. I'm so glad that uh, you talked about it, and I'm so glad that you sent it to me. And I and I see that that it's just been posted uh, in the chat here. Um, I, I strongly recommend that, that everyone read it. Um, it is um, so revealing uh, that that this is the topic of conversation when there are thousands killed in other clashes, tens, hundreds of thousands killed in in um, in, in, in in different conflicts around the world, and you know, long running political conflicts of a much greater proportion, but that don't have the, uh, the, the, the public um, magnetism that, uh, that, that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has. And um, whether it's because of Al-Aqsa and the third holiest site in Islam, or because of the fact that, that, that everyone, it seems, certainly in the Christian world, and in the Jewish world and in the Muslim world has something to relate to in that land, whereas we don't all have something to relate to in Tibet or in Kashmir or in, or in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, that's part of the fuel of all of this. Um, uh, the Bible is the most popular book in the world and where the heck was it written? And least read. <laughs> of course, as well. Um, so, you know, everyone has a stake, uh, of course, in what's happening in that land, but, um, but there is a narrative, as Maddie Friedman explains, um, there is an accepted, um, almost genetically coded narrative to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that every reporter and editor seems to have to follow, or they don't have to follow, but they're somehow pushed into following. Um, and it is a narrative in which the Palestinians are the the, the, the weak and deserving uh, underdog and the Israelis are the oppressive post-colonial um, uh, forces that are driving them away from, from their natural homes. And that's repeated in various permutations. And if a story does not fit that narrative, if it is about corruption among the Palestinians or Hamas's uh, atrocities as this Islamo-fascist group in, in, in Gaza, that doesn't really quite get covered. It doesn't get covered because if you're in Gaza and you're reporting on it, you're not going to stand around very long. You won't be allowed to, to continue doing what you're doing. Um, and, and so this narrative just repeats itself and metastasizes. So that's, that's part of the problem that we're facing. And the fact that Matty Friedman so brilliantly laid this out seven years ago, and we're seeing it again and again now, and I expect we will continue to see it. Now, how do we fix that? That's, that's a struggle. That's a huge struggle. Um, you know, AJC has a massive social media presence, but massive for our sector, not massive, you know, com compared to a uh, Gigi Haddad who has tens of millions of followers uh, on, her, on her Instagram account. We don't have that. Uh, we have millions, but we don't have tens of millions. And we're just, you know, we're one organization. There, if you put all the organizations together, can we reach a fraction of what the the celebrities who have glommed onto this cause with their one-sided narrative uh, are reaching. Um, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, you know, our, I, I would say the truth is on our side. There's a lot of passion on their side and a lot of, of, of willful ignorance of the reality. Uh, and it perpetuates. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. We're, we're working at it. I'd say we're making some headway, but it is a huge challenge. Um. There have been a, a number of questions that have that have come my way, and I want to filter them through uh, into a, a few specific categories. So, for all of you who ask questions, I'm not going to be able to ask your questions specifically, um, but uh, but in conglomerate, I will. I'm going to try to get to the major buckets of questions in the uh, in the eight minutes that we have left. Um, uh, there have been uh, a number of people. When you think about the social media presence, when you think about the the, uh, the politicians and, and some of the celebrities who have cast this very much in light of American politics. Um, this is an extension of Black Lives Matter. This is an extension of the civil rights movement. This is an extension of, of, of uh, voting rights, right? These, these analogs that we are very much uh, living now in the United States. Um, uh, is there an Israeli equivalent of Marjorie Taylor Greene? Uh, these kinds of things. So I guess uh, the, the overarching question for you, Jason, is what analogs are accurate between what might be happening in the United States and Israel? And, and what are, 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 um, are false comparisons that, uh, that are easy for us to make being in America without knowing much necessarily about, about what's happening in Israel? 
Well, I mean, you know, what's happening between Israelis and Palestinians isn't a matter of, um, you know, colonial expansion. Uh, it isn't a matter of, of a racial conflict. Um, it is um, an argument over a land that uh, they have to share. Um, and, and it isn't, you know, uh, it isn't blameless Palestinians, the underdog versus the overlords who are Israelis. Um, it isn't, uh, you know, Jewish attempts to drive um, the Palestinians into the sea. Um, not that there aren't, one has to say, um, extremists on the Israeli side, absolutely. And they, they must be called out. Uh, and they must be denied platforms to spread, you know, their 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 vitriol and 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 their twisted ideas of uh, how to treat their Palestinian neighbors. But that's not the dominant narrative, and it's not the history, and it's not the fundamentals of that society, um, and it's certainly not where the where where the diaspora that supports um, the necessity of the Jewish homeland, of the Jewish state. Uh, it's not where we are either. Um, so I think there's just this massive uh, distortion of, of the realities. Um, and and, and I, I, I share with you the anguish over seeing um, progressive causes that I personally support being hijacked uh, by, by those who, who are supporting what is essentially an anti-progressive cause um, uh, in, in Hamas and in the extremist elements of the Palestinian movement who are not willing to live side by side with Israel and share the land in a two-state solution, but want nothing more than the expulsion of Jews from, uh, from, from their native homeland. So it's, it's a very uncomfortable reality that we find um, elements who, are, who seem to be motivated by concern for human rights and, and racial justice adopting a narrative that is contrary to human rights and contrary to justice. Um, and that's, that's something that we have to continue to work with. And, and, and obviously, uh, Rabbi Miller, you're, the constituency that you're so focused on you know, has, is really ground zero in this battle that we are, that we are all waging. Sure, sure. Um, and and, and it, it's, it, to, to, to draw those comparisons is one thing to back those up is certainly another. And no one's, actually, no one's asking on Twitter for, for factual evidence. Uh, which is certainly one of the one of the challenges here. Um, one of the other assertions that uh, that has um, a number of people have asked, um, and that we're seeing portrayed throughout much of Western media is that um, Israel is is engaging in some in some aspect of, of, of uh, needless escalation. Uh, clearly, there is a disproportionate uh, military ability between one side and the other. Um, and, um, and how does the, uh, does Israel's, um, uh, I'm quoting one of the questions here, uh, outsized military response, uh, play into the perpetuation of this conflict? Um, very important question. I, I'm not, I'm not a military man. I'm, I'll do the best I can to. We're, I'm going to ask a similar question to our third, to our third presenter as well. In, in, in three weeks. Okay, very good. Um, but the, um. I think I think the Israeli military is just sick and tired, and the Israeli public is sick and tired of every few years having again an arsenal uh, that has built up and is then fired into uh, Israeli towns and cities, uh, and a desire this time to do what they can to so significantly degrade Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad's arsenal, and so reestablish Israeli deterrence that uh, we are not likely to see that kind of. Um, eruption of violence again anytime soon. The unfortunate fact is, as we all know, and frankly, as, as Matty Friedman wrote about even seven years ago, um, Gaza underground is laced with tunnels that contain bomb making, uh, rocket making uh, factories and, and, and storage depots for, uh, for, for rockets and mortars. Um, and and the way that you attack that is you, you know, you bomb streets that have tunnels underneath them. And there are buildings on top of those tunnels as well. And the buildings collapse and terrible suffering takes place. Um, it is a, a terrible dilemma that Israeli military planners are facing. They are doing their best to selectively target um, the, the sites that they, are, that they are going after and warning 
civilians in advance when that's possible to do, and they were doing it a lot, far more than other armies ever do. But um, but there are inevitable uh, collateral casualties, and it's uh, it's painful to watch, and it is of course you know further fueling this. Uh, um, provocation that then that then takes place and then is exploited by by the uh, by the extremists on the Palestinian side. Yeah, yeah. Are, are casualties the, the goal or the regret? Right, I think is, is, yeah. is what this comes yeah. to. Um, mm-hmm. I, I have I, there are many more questions, but I know it's nine thirteen, and maybe I could just ask one final question if, if that's all right. Um, uh, and, and and that is de-escalation. Uh, we're seeing in the news today that, uh, and you alluded to this, Jason, uh, at the front of our conversation, that in the next day or two or three, there might be a de-escalation that's happening. Um, what from the Israeli side would be needed for de-escalation and what from the Hamas side would, would be required for de-escalation? What, what are they both looking for in order to de-escalate? Well, I mean, obviously the, you know, the short answer, the easiest answer would be for Hamas to stop firing. Um, I, I hope that that happens. Uh, it may be that, um, as has been suggested by some analysts, that Israel will stop firing. Um, seeing seeing the the rocket launchings decline, Israel may choose to issue a ceasefire or a, a, an announcement that it is it is not firing. Um, as long as the Palestinians don't restart, they won't restart. Um, this is this has happened in the past. I know the Egyptians are trying to mediate something here. I know we will also, by the way, while, while that drama is playing out, we will see in New York tomorrow in the UN General Assembly uh, an effort to uh, once again put Israel in the dock and have a, a UN General Assembly resolution um, condemning Israel. Um, the United States has strongly supported Israel in the UN Security Council. Um, it doesn't, it, it can't block UN General Assembly action, but UN General Assembly action is rhetorical. It doesn't have the teeth that a UN Security Council action would. But again, I, but, I, but I do have to commend the United States for standing so firmly um, with Israel, while 14 other UN Security Council member states wanted to go in a different direction in terms of condemning Israel. Um, so, I, I, but again, I, I do believe, as I said earlier, and as you just said again, Rabbi Miller, I, I, I'm expecting within a very few days I'm hoping fewer than, than, than three, but we'll see that, uh, that, that Israel will recognize that it has accomplished what it can accomplish without encourage, incurring even more um, damage um, politically um, as well as physically, and that, uh, and that we will find a way out of this uh, current crisis. That is my fervent hope. Well, Jason, I want to thank you and thank uh, Aaron for his insights and uh, <clears throat> to our special guest that felt a little bit like Woody Allen where you just used to do in the movies you pull in somebody I pulled in Ed who spent <coughs> so many years in Sarajevo um, <coughs> I do want to say that um, that um, we all become talking heads when something of this begins to happen I think next week we will hear from uh, and Jason has been working on this in the political analyst and been doing the real-time work and understands the nuances that have gotten us to the Abraham Accord and gotten us to new horizons, which I hope that can be preserved and uh, perpetuated. Next week, we will be honored to uh, have a two individuals who've been graced our congregation, Julian Resnick, a phenomenal teacher, um, who is a South African who made Aliyah uh, more than 40 years ago, uh, uh, was major in the Habunim organization, but is a masterful teacher and has been working to show the real uh, compassion of Israel. Uh, he is going to join us. We're also going to be joined by Mohammed Fahili, who is the director of the Klal Center. If you remember, he spoke to our congregation on Yom Kippur. Uh, several years ago, um, and he has uh, he resides in uh, Kirat Wilson in Akko and um, has been called on, and there are some reports that he singly, single-handedly has returned, uh, done what the police were not able to do or others because he has the goodwill of both sides returning Akko to uh, a peaceable time. He's an amazing individual and will uh, speak with us as well. And then... Um, I have to tell you what's very sad, two very strong activists have both had to turn us down because they have family still in Gaza. And this is the terrible thing is that when somebody fears 
that if they speak their mind and are considered a collaborator in any form or fashion, that their family will pay for it. Um, that that is uh, a reality that we just uh, is just so horrible to think about. Anyway, a woman who is uh, I'm blanking on her name. I think it's a uh, um, Irna uh, Birat, I believe. I um, she is a lives in East Jerusalem. She has a, a cultural program that is run. Uh, it is a 360 cultural experiencing, understanding the Palestinian culture. Um, she will be joining us uh, next week. And it, it's going to be, uh, it, it'll be difficult for us to hear what is there. I highly recommend that people read Yosef Bashar's uh, book and join us this Sunday on the Amram Scholar Series. It, it is a uh, unbelievable story. And um, it is something that I think most of us don't have any idea of what the effects have been on the Palestinian, uh, this is one Palestinian family uh, of what uh, it has been for Israel to have to maintain its presence uh, in uh, Gaza. So uh, Jason, we want to thank you. I, I really appreciate your optimism, uh, your candor, but most importantly, the experience and knowledge that you bring to this. I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Um, we're going to uh, We'll get the codify the questions from that you were sent in, and we'll try to address them. I want to uh, next week. I think we're going to try to open it up a little bit for more dialogue. Um, but uh, seeing that it's eight nine eighteen, and we've over our allotted time, um, unless there are some just burning, 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 burning questions, um, I think we may call it uh, an evening. So. Um, I've got it on mute. There are a lot of folks on. We were up, but thank you so much, Jason. We wish you well, and uh, thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Rabbi Miller, and thank, thank you. you to Washington Hebrew for joining us uh, in this evening, and next week we will hear from uh, the three panelists that I mentioned. The week after, uh, you want to tell them a little bit about our guest on uh, June 2nd, Aaron? Sure, Jonathan Chandler, the uh, the vice president for the uh, 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 FDD. Uh, I, I'll need to look up the your... democracy, uh, defense of democracy. I yes. think it's called. Thank you, defense of democracy. Um, uh, he will be joining us. He is um, he has much greater insight into Iran's role in uh, in all of this as a regional player. This is a small piece in a much larger puzzle, um, and he's going to help. Uh, give us the, uh, the zoomed out version of what this conflict looks like for geopolitics across the Middle East. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. I, I hope you'll join us on June 2nd for it. So we end with the words, O say shalom bin Ramav, hu ya say shalom aleinu, v'kol ben adam. Uh, may the one who makes peace make peace not only on Israel, but all of all humanity. Our great hope is that the violence we're in, but more than the violence we're in, that the, uh, the, uh, Gordian knot that has been the crisis between the Palestinians and Israeli will begin to unravel, that the hope that we have seen of building bridges with our Arab neighbors will continue to flourish, and that uh, people who want to live in peace and to have the prosperity of a, a comfortable life that, that doesn't feel oppressive uh, in any form or fashion will begin to flourish. Uh, I do believe it's attainable. I do believe as uh, men and women of the reform movement and, and people of conscience that uh, it is incumbent upon us to continue to learn, but continue to speak and to act in order to foster peace throughout the world. Uh, I want to, uh, we'll uh, also have available next week. When does the global forum, I think I'm already registered. I don't remember when it begins. Is it the 19th? No, it's actually June 6th through 9th. 6th through 9th. No, it's during the time of my uh, my mother's birthday. So that's, I think I'm registered, but, uh, but we'll be coming in and out. It is, I highly recommend it. And um, Jason, thank you so much. And thank we'll, you. we appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Rabbi.